when I was growing up, uh, a lot of times it, people are like, well, you must have grown up with an activist family. You must have been leaning in this direction already. When I was growing up, I had a traveling preacher for a father. And I, and I acknowledge to people that irony is not lost on me that I turned into a version of my dad. <laughs> um, I now go around the world preaching my message. It's a little different, but I'm still preaching a message I got that I somehow, through osmosis, turned into my father. Uh, so that was my life growing up. Uh, we were literally in church or on the road to the next church. And uh, so I didn't really have... I was raised to appreciate nature, but I was not raised with this deep inquiry into nature as self instead of nature as something separate. And we, we walk around on it, we move around it, we use it for resource. It's a different kind of worldview that many of us have of nature as something separate. And that was the way I was raised, especially with a preacher for a father where it was like, you know, you worship the creator, not the creation, and we're here to have dominion and that kind of a, a story. And, <clears throat> but I was raised to appreciate nature. The other thing that had a very big influence on me is that I was raised very, very poor. And um, we ate the food that other people gave us, wore the clothes that other people gave us. My family was in service. Like my father, we would end up, you know, my dad would be preaching at my brothers and I would do puppet shows for the kids. And then we would be doing that in churches, really small churches in the middle of nowhere. And we lived off of what people, they passed the basket, whatever they put in. And even in places where we went where people gave a lot for what they had, the area was so poor that oftentimes it wasn't even enough to pay the gas to get to the next place. So we really lived off the generosity of others. In our current society, people like I was growing up are made to feel ashamed, stupid, ugly, bad, because we couldn't just go to the store and buy something that was in style. And I, I'm about five foot ten, and I've been this tall since I was 12. So hand-me-downs don't fit 5 to 10, 12-year-olds. And I was made to feel very ashamed. And one of the memories that literally was pounded into my body is I was about, I want to say I was about 8, right around that age. And I was wearing polyester plaid bell bottoms. And because I've been this tall since I was 12, I was a really tall 8-year-old. So the bell bottoms were like 3 inches too short, and I literally looked like a bell. Like my feet were the dinger out of the bottom of the bell. And I was very embarrassed. And at that time, before my family started traveling full time, my grandparents paid for my young, my brothers and I to go to a private school because we lived in the slums and the school where I lived was very, very dangerous. So my, my grandparents paid for us to go to a private school. So we'd be on a bus with kids with lots of money. And this one day, the kids got on the bus and they put thumbtacks in between their fingers on this day that I had plaid pants on. And they came up to me and said, who wants to play checkers? And they started slamming the thumbtacks into my legs. And so I literally, you know, the reason I share this is because even though we don't oftentimes do that physically in our society, that's how we behave. If you look at the cover of our magazines, you look at what's on TV with all the entertainment shows and all that, it is a version of slamming thumbtacks into each other. We have shows that grade people the fashion police. Like when I see that show and I hear that, I think of the thumbtacks in my legs. I am clear that that's what they're doing, and we've given it another name. And we pay them to do it. It's a form of bullying, and it's a form of bullying because it says our value is based on what we wear and what we look like and where we might live and what car we drive and who we're dating or who we're breaking up with, and that has nothing to do with the quality of our <laughs> lives. <laughs> it doesn't, but I know this on a deep level because of what I experienced growing up. But before I had the awareness I have now, because it was literally beaten into me that what's important is shallow, when I came to university, I did not major in biology, I did not major in social sciences, I did not major in forestry, anything like you might think I might have majored in, I majored in business. And I spent two semesters only studying business because I wanted to open my own business, so I just wanted the tools to be able to do that, and then that's what I did. <clears throat> I became a success story in America's eyes. I you know, grew up poor made something of myself, put myself through school, started my own business when I was 18 years old, I became successful at it. And I was the all-American success story, you know? You can raise yourself up and do something with your life. And then in August of 1996, my friend wanted to hang out with me, but she'd been drinking. I haven't owned a car since I was 18. And she called me and she said, hey girl, you wanna hang out? I was like, yeah, totally. She said, well, I've been drinking, I shouldn't be driving. Will you take a cab and come get me? And I said, of course got in a cab, went to her, we got into her 
two-door hatchback Honda Civic. We made it out of the parking lot to our very first stop and was hit by a drunk driver driving a Ford Bronco. He hit us so hard, the back of the car went to the back of the seats. The glass from the back of the car ricocheted off the front of the car, cut my eyes, my face, my chest, my arms. And the most intense part was that my head collided with the steering wheel, the steering wheel went into my skull, and I lost a huge amount of my short-term memory and my motor skills. To get a drink of water, pardon me. It took nearly a year to recover to be able to be a person who could be up here in front of you today carrying on a conversation. My short-term memory was so damaged, I stuttered when I talked because I would forget what I was saying while I was saying it. There are some people in the world today who wish I still had that problem, actually, but <laughs> a lot of physical therapy and brain therapy, I recovered from that, mostly. But it was during that recovery time that I began rethinking my life again because I wasn't sure if I was going to recover or not. It's a long journey when you have that severe brain damage and you don't know where you're going to end up on the journey. And what that made me do was rethink that whole story that I'd had since I was a child. Because I had gone from being worthless and bad and ugly to being a success story to, oh my goodness, I might not be able to work again. In today's conversation that we buy into, it would have said I was worthless again. Right? Because I couldn't have gone back to making money and doing all those things that we say is valuable. And what that awakened in me was a desire to find the difference between perceived value and real value. And I got on a very deep, deep, visceral level that there's a very big difference between perceived value and real value. And we live in a world and in a culture that is about perceived value. And yet, what's paying the price for that? The quality of our air for all, not just for those who are rich enough to live in a nice neighborhood. The quality of water for all, not just those who are rich enough to go buy it cleaned up in a water bottle. And oh, by the way, nature's been doing that for free <laughs> for a long time. The quality of food and the access to that food for all, not just for those who are rich enough to be able to read the label and opt out. The quality of our communities, our educational system, the, how safe are our children, how cared for our elders. These are real value. Everything else is perceived value. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but that I had that realization after my wreck that we have placed the value of perceived values above the value of real values. And that's why we are where we are in the world today. So I had that aha as I was healing, and then I had friends going on a road trip. One of their friends backed out at the last minute, so they needed someone to fill the spot, because when you're you know, in university age, around this age, like every penny counts, right? So if you have a road trip planned, you already know who's going to pay what part of the, the fuel fund. So somebody backing out, they're like, oh, we need somebody to fill that spot. Julie, do you want to go? And it, this was two weeks after I was released from my last doctor after the wreck. And I said, yes, because I love to travel and haven't been able to travel for a year. Got in the car, make a long story short, ended up in California, had my first experience with the Redwoods, was blown away by the Redwoods. There was something for me that was so profound, um, especially because I had some issues going back to my childhood being raised with a preacher for a father. And this ties in a lot to the, the biggest reason why I'm here, which is the department in the university that's around feminist studies, that for me as a woman, it was something I was always, I had a question about growing up. And I was like, why is Jesus a male and God a male? And then there's the spirit. Where, where are my people at? <laughs> and then why in the Bible is most of the references about women, around who they're married to or who they're giving birth to? And I was like, but what about if I want to do something besides that? <laughs> and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the Christian religion if that's what you're inclined to be fulfilled by. Bless you for that. But for me, being an independent feminine thinker from the time I was born, I was like, I just don't fit in this religion. It doesn't quite work for me. And whenever I had questions I couldn't answer, that's when they'd always be like, you just have to have faith. And being a stubborn, opinionated child that I still am at 40 years old, that didn't quite work for me. So I had, this, I had this challenge with religion most of my life. And when I entered the Redwoods for the first time, I was like, oh my God, this is what church is supposed to feel like. Like, I get it. Like, this is, this is what it's supposed to feel like. And what I realized in that moment is that for me, the sacred has never been about rules and regulations, right and wrong. It's about awakening to a sense of awe and a sense of reverence, and a sense of wonder. The kind